Luke Brown. Welcome to Vital Psychedelic Conversations. Really excited to have you here. I know you've been on the show before and have done some stuff with us at, at Psychedelics today, but could you just do a little brief bio of um, some of your work if this is the first time people are tuning in and don't know anything about you? Sure. Uh, I'm a founding professor of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami. I uh, started teaching a course on psychedelics in culture back in 1975 and uh, was surprised to learn that it was the first university for credit course in the country exclusively on psychedelics. My main research, along with my wife and co-author Julie Brown, who's a psychotherapist, uh, has been in uh, psychedelics and religion. Uh, we published in 2016 the Psychedelic Gospels, the Hidden History of Hallucinogens in Christianity, uh, revealing psychedelic mushroom images in Christian art in cathedral and churches throughout Europe and the Middle East. And we've done some follow-up articles uh, on that particular uh, topic in the Journal of Psychedelic Studies. I also wrote a book review uh, looking at the pros and cons of uh, Brian Mororesco's very popular, The Immortality Key. Uh, out of Julie's work with uh, both psychedelics and also psychotherapy, particularly with cancer patients, uh, we started looking closely at the Johns Hopkins Cancer Psilocybin Study of 2016, and we've written some, uh, some articles on uh, mystical experience and psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. So psychedelics and religion, psychedelics and psychotherapy, and Julie presents with me at times. She's a mental health counselor, uh, MA in uh, counseling psychology, and she presents with me sometime on these particular topics. That's our main work. We're devoted at this stage of our life to teaching, research, and writing about psychedelics. And the last thing I want to say is uh, there's an old saying, man plans, God laughs. Not in my wildest imagination could I imagine still be teaching this topic to overflowing classes 50 years mm. after I started. And this is all obviously boosted by the uh, wonderful psychedelic renaissance that we're all involved in. Yeah, it must be exciting for you to kind of see it, eat, like be there and have the first like kind of course in psychedelics kind of be at the forefront. And then, yeah, this whole new resurgence, it's got to be really exciting on, on your part, as well as everybody else kind of part of this too. But I can imagine those that have been around for a while. It's like, you know, I know one of my teachers is always like, I didn't think I would uh, see this really take off as much as um, it, it is. Um, you know, I thought maybe it would be way years in, in the future. Um <clears throat> So just a reminder, too. So we have a, um, a course uh, that you developed called Psychedelics Past, Present, and Future, which is um, now available. It's a pre-recorded course, um, about six hours or so, six recorded lectures with some additional materials. Um, and if you're interested in checking that out, you can check that out at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. Um, and if you want to go back into our podcast uh, archive, um, you can check out the one of our podcasts that we did with Jerry. I think it was actually, I think we just titled it Psychedelics Alex past, present, and future, um, where you can get a, a, a deeper overview of some of the topics within that course. But Jerry, do you want to mention anything about the course and um, what, sure. what we touched on? Sure. There's uh, six in recorded there? sessions, and there's also ample resources, directory of psychedelic organization companies and uh, therapy training programs, uh, using some other research, the 10 uh, most influential people in psychedelics, bibliography. And then uh, as additional notes to each of the you know, uh, recorded sessions, there are also videos and articles, uh, supplementary materials to enrich uh, a person's understanding of psychedelics past, present, and future. Uh, I think, having taught this for a long time, that it's important for people involved in any aspect of the field to have a good understanding of the roots of psychedelica, uh, you know, all the way back into the archaeological history and as McKenna uh, hypothesized, even possibly through the stoned ape theory, involved in the evolution of consciousness, the biggest mystery in, in uh, archaeology and in many fields, how did we become human? Uh, to the present, what's happening with the psychedelic renaissance on so many fronts, and then into the future, what's happening in terms of opportunities, business, law, public policy, given the legalization and decriminalization movements already passed in Oregon and well underway in many other states. And then finally, 
um, I look at emerging career opportunities in psychedelics because obviously, um, you know, you have this marvelous program in terms of training uh, psychedelic therapists. There are other programs out there and that's a, a, a big emerging future right now to be able to uh, be a guide in clinical research programs, to be able to be involved in, uh, in uh, FDA clinical research for psychedelic medicine companies, and eventually this is all going to be legalized. But what people don't all realize very often is there are other opportunities in, uh, let's take law for example, and, and specialization, so people who are you know, doing something they're happy with in their field, and now there are issues of intellectual property, of protecting indigenous communities that involve uh, international law, that involve patent right. So there's an opportunity for lawyers. Um, I'm going to mention later on today, I think that one of the most promising areas for doctors is psychedelic medicine. I mean, here you have a treasure trove. Let's not even call them psychedelics. Let's talk about a treasure trove of medicine that's been hidden away for 50 years because it was all banned from research under being Schedule One under Nixon's um, Controlled Substances Act and the war, launching of the War on Drugs in 1970. And 50 years later, this treasure trove is opened up and it's showing many promising avenues for everything from Alzheimer's to possibly even cancer. We will get into that a little bit later. What about all of the nonprofit organizations that are springing up? Well, they all need staff, fundraisers, writers, media managers, IT managers. So there are a lot of ways to get involved in psychedelics today, including getting involved in one of the many psychedelic societies that's either in your town already or you know coming to a, a theater near you in the, in the near future. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. <clears throat> Lots of work ahead of us as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the other things we do in the course, we take a deep dive into um, shamanism and world religions, the historical roots of psychedelics, uh, Ibogaine among the Fang people of Gabon in, uh, in Gabon in Africa, uh, Peyote Quest among the Huichol of Mexico, obviously Ayahuasca uh, among the Conibo and, and other peoples of the Amazon. We go into that and then we also go into the role of psychedelics in world religions, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all well documented now in terms of art history and textual references, including our own work on uh, psychedelics uh, in Christianity, answering, trying to answer the question, does Christianity have a psychedelic history? Uh, in terms of the psychedelic renaissance, we also go into, and I, by we, I say my wife, Julie and I, who co-presents with me at times, into passion and purpose how psychedelics can be used, one, uh, to find purpose in life, what, what James Hillman called your soul's code, so to speak, but putting you in touch with what are you really here to do? Uh, I, we, Julie and I talk about how LSD helped us overcome or helped me overcome the fear of commitment and in terms of uh, getting married, mm -hmm. making a decision finally to, to, to get married. And, you know, LSD being the truth serum that really revealed who we were to each other. And then, um, won't go into it much now, but late in life, uh, I fell into a rare nine-month depression and nothing could get me out of it. I mean, anti-depression uh, anti drugs, sleep drugs, uh, Joe Dispenza, Tara Brock meditations, uh, everything. It was like shooting a water gun at a nuclear uh, aircraft carrier. And then I did a not one ayahuasca session and the depression was gone. I had three major insights and breakthroughs wow. and it was gone. I mean, it's just, you know, the song that brings you home. It's, it's, a, it's wonderful. It's no uh, mystery that many people call it mother ayahuasca. So these are things that we'll touch yeah. on. And in terms of the uh, looking at the psychedelic renaissance, where the mothership of that is really Johns Hopkins School of Medicine under Roland Griffiths. And um, their breakthrough papers in 2006, 2008, showing that psilocybin could be safely administered in clinical settings to healthy people, mood elevation, 
better outlook on life and long lasting at least 14 months. You know, how long it's really gonna last, that's a big, big question. But this was a real breakthrough and created the scientific methodologically sound basis for moving psychedelics from the underground uh, into the uh, mainstream. Uh, we're also very, very fascinated with the finding by Johns Hopkins and NYU, both of whom did uh, psilocybin cancer studies to see if high-dose psilocybin would reduce anxiety, depression, and alleviate fear of death in advanced cancer patients. And the answer was a, a resounding yes. But what, and, and that was all incredible in and of itself. I mean, as Roland Griffith said, if you can get 70% success with one or two sessions, long lasting, even we researchers, we never expected this finding. But what really caught Julie and my eyes was the statement that, that NYU and Johns Hopkins put out, Kyle, that said the, and I'm gonna quote, I've got it right here. In both trials, the intensity of the mystical experience described by patients correlated with the degree to which their depression and anxiety decreased. Now let's just contemplate what's going on here. We have white-coated shamans, clinicians, administering synthetic psilocybin in a laboratory setting to advanced cancer patients. And it turns out that the occurrence of a mystical experience was the key to healing in these situations, bringing science and religion back together again. And they've been separated. I mean, C.P. Snow, the philosopher, the philosopher talked about um, the two cultures, science and religion, and never the twain shall meet. Well, they're meeting in psychedelic studies in sort of this re-spiritualization, re-sacralization of the world in some experiences that people have. So we're going to get into a lot of good stuff uh, in this course, and um, I hope you'll join me in it. Yeah, yeah. And again, people can check that out at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. So be sure to check that out. <clears throat> so Jerry, we kick off this series um, with a question. And that question is, what do you think the most vital psychedelic conversation people should be having right now? Yeah, you know, I, I, I've been thinking about this a while. And I, and I think there's three. Um, I think number one is why it's worthwhile and why it's important to understand um, the role of psychedelics in religion. Number two, I think it's what is happening with the um, turning in the psychedelic renaissance towards a business model. And there's pros and cons of this, but the question comes up, will psychedelics survive success? And by that I mean, will the kind of psychedelic experience that's um, gone on through the 60s and 70s and in through the psychedelic underground and inspired many researchers Will that be carried over into the clinical applications and will certain companies, I mean, there's $4.5 billion of capital that have been now raised for public stock exchange listed psychedelic companies to do this research. It's like the early dot com, Kyle. They have no revenue. They're dealing yeah. with subject products that are not legal and they're working to prove out these concepts. So in a traditional business model, you want patents, you want intellectual property protection. So you can make that investment, attract investors and be protected. However, when you bring it into a well-established psychedelic community and you say, as some companies have done and applied for patents that say, I'm going to patent a certain psilocybin molecule and I'm going to try to see that that's the only one uh, because of my you know, political lobbying muscle that I'm developing is the only one that's legalized for use. And I'm also going to patent how a therapist can touch the client, the kind of comfortable chairs in the room, the protocol for the psilocybin session, lie back, 
put eye shades on, headphones on for music. I mean, these patents are supposed to be novel inventions. These are things that Stanislav Grof was doing with, as one of the developers of LSD psychotherapy back in the late 1950s. But if they, if these companies, so this whole question of will psychedelics survive success, uh, can patent this, it could come to a situation where no therapy service center could administer a therapy without getting a license from that company. And we're also talking about packaging these things for like $10,000 a session, where, you know, in the underground, these things are available for, you know, a few hundred dollars a day. So there's a lot of questions. To answer this question, will psychedelics survive sex? I absolutely believe so. It survived the coming of monotheism. It survived the Inquisition and the Black Plague. And it also survived Nixon and the war on drugs. So I think life and sacred plants will always find a way. But there are new kinds of challenges uh, emerging here that need, to be, uh, that need to be looked at. And then the third thing I'd like to talk about is what I call beyond mental health, psychedelics and medicine. And the developments that are going on, this is, this is another conversation that I need to think needs to take place. So we've talked about uh, psychedelics in religion, why it's uh, important to know about that. We've talked about a little bit about will psychedelics survive success? That's a, a conversation that is taking place and needs to take place. And then the third thing is psychedelics in medicine. And here, um, we many of the applications for mental health, depression, anxiety, addiction, uh, even criminal recidivism, as Leary first proved or, or got underway back in the 60s, are well underway. And some of these, like um, MAPS's um, MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder and also psilocybin for depression, are being fast-tracked by the Food and Drug Administration. And this is because they're breakthrough therapies. They've got nothing new in the last 30 or 40 years. And the stuff they have is only X percent effective, has to be taken every day, and has some nasty side effects. So this is all well underway. Now it's the next frontier. And I'm not saying that that's unimportant, but that will continue. But the next frontier is really psychedelics in medicine and the application to neurological disorders. Uh, if I may, let me come back and, and try to address this question of, you know, why it's important to understand the roots of psychedelics, especially in Christianity. And I think there are three reasons here. And, and my convictions here grow out of the findings that Julie and I made of multiple psychedelic Amanita and Muscaria and psilocybin variety images in a variety of Christian artwork from, you know, the 300s on up until uh, 1300, showing that, that Christianity has a psychedelic, psychedelic history. Why it's relevant to the psychedelic renaissance and possibly the future of psychedelics, I think is threefold. First of all, it may, in time, provide a catalyst for the Catholic Church's return to its mystical roots involving psychedelics and involving the direct and theogenic experience of the divine. And this is not, you know, this is what we hope to will be a possible implication of our book. It's not the finding. But it is that this is a mystery that's involved in many religions. It's in Judaism. It's in the Old Testament. I have some incredible quotes from the Old Testament. It's in um, Hinduism. The Soma of the Hindu Rig Veda was the Amanita Muscaria um, mushroom. And so what's happening right now is you have clinicians who are creating mystical experience. How long will the mainstream religions allow this to happen? Or will they say, we can now re-embrace these. These were parts of our roots. The second reason, if that happens, 
it could very well open the door for the establishment of religious retreat centers, sort of Albert Hoffman's uh, modern Eleusis, after the Greek Eleusinian mysteries that Albert Hoffman envisioned, where the church could offer the faithful safe psychedelic journeys for healing and revelation in the presence of trained guides. I don't think this is out of the question, and we're also seeing certain um, Christian groups that are already incorporating psychedelic ceremonies. And we know from uh, Santo Daime and UDV, uh, Union de Vegetal in Brazil, which use uh, the ayahuasca, which contains DMT, and this has been endorsed by the Brazilian Council of Bishops, the Catholic Council of Bishops. So it is not a given that there's an irreconcilable difference between the church uh, or Judaism or um, other religions and psychedelics. And so the creation of these sacred centers for spiritual growth, um, revelation, in terms of your own religious framework, are, is a possibility. And the third is a legal reason. It may very well meet the quote-unquote bona fide traditional ceremony purpose. The bona fide traditional ceremony purpose requirement that's specified in the federal 1993 Religious Freedom Restoration Act and thereby establishing a basis for the legalization of the religious use of psychedelics. This has already happened in the United States in terms of peyote, peyote use by the Native American church, which has some 300,000 followers among indigenous peoples. And it's also happened with the U.S. branches of the Brazilian church of Santo Deme and UDV. And the, the criteria here, like Leary tried to, you know, create the LSD church, uh, but he couldn't prove and couldn't argue, and maybe he, he didn't want to argue, that there was a bona fide traditional use that could give it a legal basis. Well, that, that goes all the way back to the First Amendment, but it really wasn't codified until 1993 in this Federal Religion Restoration Act. So, you know, maybe Leary couldn't have, definitely couldn't have taken advantage of that back in the 1960s. But the important point is it would create a um, federal, a basis in federal law if you can demonstrate a traditional use of psychedelics in your religious organization, you have a legal basis for arguing uh, that you should be able to use them in ritual practice. So those are the three reasons. We discover its mystic roots, open the door for re uh, psychedelic retreat centers, and possibly create the legal basis by showing the historical roots of psychedelics and Judaism and Christianity and other religions for legalization under federal law in the United States. Yeah, that's something um, one of my teachers really reminds us is that, yeah, the United States is pretty special that we have this like religious freedom, right? And with the with the First Amendment um, and just how much possible potential here uh, there is um, for kind of exploring this avenue. But I guess the, the tricky thing is trying to get... There's several things here. One, uh, the court all the way up to the Supreme Court works on precedent. And you also already have the precedent, as I've mentioned, of legalizing peyote for use by Native Americans in the Native American church and you have the precedent that's been affirmed in certain states of utilizing DMT in ayahuasca in certain branches of the Brazilian churches. The third thing is one of the very few items that the Supreme Court seems to have been unified on in you know, the past tumultuous years is protecting religious freedom. And this has uh, nothing to do with psychedelics, but it has something to do with shamanism. And uh, among the Afro-Cuban religions, Macumbe in Brazil, Curandismo in Dominican Republic, 
uh, voodoo in Haiti. We have Santeria in Cuba and Miami. And Santeria, part of its divination practice, so the Santero can divine, you know, what the person's illness or malady or, or problem is with a, a, a malicious spirit, is animal sacrifice. And um, a Santero, and he's very public by the name of Ernesto Pichardo, in Miami, decided to open, to take Santeria, like psychedelics was, out of the shadows and establish a public church of Santeria in Hialeah in Miami. And the, and the city fathers would have nothing to do with it. They passed several laws, including laws against animal sacrifice in a religious place, very specifically designed to, um, to prevent that church from functioning. Well, Ernesto Pichardo, on the prophecy and divination that are part of Santeria that was made when he was born, was that he was going to bring this to the public. It was his mission. And he took it to the county, to the state of Florida Supreme Court. He got defeated. He took it to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I think it was in 1993, he won a 9-0 decision in favor of him because, under the, the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act that says, unless there is like some super compelling reason that we can't even conceive of, the government shall not abrogate your right to practice religion as you see fit. So there's precedent, both in terms of psychedelics and there's precedent all the way up to the Supreme Court. So I don't, I don't think it's out of the question. Look, Kyle, let, let's look at it this way. Imagine you were around in the 1600s or 1700s when the telescope was invented. And think of what's happened from the invention of that telescope over several hundred years to launching the James Webb Space Telescope that can peer billions and tens of billions of light years into the galaxy. I mean, unimaginable progress. The same thing with the, the, the microscope, you know? And where we've come until the mid 1900s to the invention of the electron microscope from those first little lenses that that Dutch inventor put together. Well, I think for all of us involved in psychedelics, we're in that early stage now. We're like cathedral builders from the Middle Ages who laid the plans and maybe started on a cathedral that wouldn't be finished for 100 or 200 years long after they're gone. So I think we are just seeing the beginnings of the possibility of one, what can be, what can the benefits of psychedelics can be psychologically and medically and spiritually and creatively. I mean, Steve Jobs, psychedelics was one of the two or three most significant things in his life and helped him think different in creating Apple, scientific and, and innovation. And so we're at the very beginning and what, how that's gonna emerge 50, 100, 200 years. I mean, all of these possibilities that we're discussing now. Um, I have no idea, knows? right? <laughs> you know, who, who knows? And will some people's dreams of, of creating a, a global psychedelic society? Well, who knows? <laughs> Yeah, and I, I really kind of like this religious spiritual context too, because it um, you know kind of puts it outside. There's been such an emphasis on psychedelics for mental health, um, but yeah, what about you know this idea of bettering the well and developing maybe a richer spiritual life um, with psychedelics? And I think there's a lot of potential there. And I also kind of think about something um, coming from like our, our breathwork realm and something one of my teachers said around. You know, a lot of people can sometimes think about it as say some sort of like mental health treatment, which is not how it's typically advertised, um, but people are seeking healing, being able to kind of advertise it as spiritual and professional development. And I think psychedelics should also be kind of falling within that realm as well um, to really kind of cultivate that deeper, um, you know, 
relationship with the universe and however you want to define that right um and then what happens i guess on the mental health level when you have a richer um inner experience and, and relationship to the universe do things start to um you know heal in in a sense so yeah i'm excited to see how the religious uh, angle plays out and i'm really curious to see how it all unfolds in in oregon as they legalize psilocybin um, service centers and if kind of like the religious angle will will take roots there and um, people will be able to host those types of retreats um because yeah i think there's there's huge potential there yeah and you know the 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 really magic of what you're saying is that it is the spiritual experience the intensity of the mystical experience that seems to be the the kind of magical key that opens the door to healing to what groff calls the activation of that inner self-healing intelligence that psychedelics brings to the surface. So you have, mm -hmm. even in the mental health area, you have a spiritual component of the healing process. And uh, people having, you know, mystical out of time and place, mythical archetypal experiences that help them break out of the mental and psychological prisons or pathways that are, are trapping them in a kind of a negative feedback loop that Robin Carthart Harris says is kind of the key what in his theory capture behind all, you know, trying to develop a unified theory of, of mental illness. But on the other side of things, um, under the Pew uh, Research Center, their religious survey, there's now 20% of the people in, in America who consider themselves spiritual but not religion, but not religious spiritual but not religious and that jumps up to like 33 percent among the youth so people are moving away from traditional religious institutions and for certain people and obviously not everyone exploring um, spirituality involves psychedelics and if they were as gordon wasson suggests the root of all religions it's not surprising because the, you know, the answer, fear of death, what happens, where do we come from, where are we going, the big questions that psychedelics seems to open the door to existential authoritative answers. It's yeah. very exciting. I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts. So I've, I heard you mention, you know, mystical experiences kind of correlating to positive change. Um, and that really kind of came out of Hopkins uh, research. Um, and like, what do you th have? Have you seen any of the articles recently about taking mysticism and the mystical experience out of the psychedelics and, and out of the clinical um, research? And I know this is kind of a debate um, with within the research community of like, you know, do we always need to make the psychedelic experience mystical or, or put that classification around it? Um, even though you know it seems that some of the research early on was suggesting you know these higher dose mystical experiences correlated to change, and now we're kind of starting to maybe have these conversations of maybe wanting to pull that out of the experience to some degree. And I wonder if you have any thoughts or if kind of yeah, stayed I, up to date I, on, I on some of those debates. I have a thought of it. It's like um, <laughs> taking the music and dancing out of West Side Story. Mm. <laughs> That's, that to me is, is where we're going because, look, first of all, one, not all psychedelic experience is mystical experience. And as Stanislav Grof, uh, in the minds of many people, the most brilliant writer, researcher uh, of our time with six decades of experience, many books, including his recent The Way of the Shaman, uh, The Way of the Psychonaut, The Way of the Psychonaut, published by MAPS, a, a two volume um, opus, uh, you know, overview of his life's work. Um, you know, as he documented, there are many varieties of psychedelic experience. There's dual unity, as Julie and I had together, um, you know, where we completely merged, our energies completely merged with one another and, and spiraled up to the heavens with not one cell of resistance. And then we knew that we were for each other. All right. There's um, and um, there are experiences of encountering other entities voices that speak with complete authority and agency that some people interpret as divine voices. 
and certainly meeting other entities as is frequently reported under uh, DMT. There's the accelerated mental process, thinking more quickly. There's Jim Fadiman's experiments with creativity where he took, uh, in about 1968, mature scientists, architect, chemists, mathematicians, who had been working on a problem they couldn't solve for three to six months, and with a high dose of psychedelics, pre and post, 81% of them came up with solutions. One architect went through the entire visual history of architecture and came up with a design solution that his client brought, bought after rejecting 50 other um, you know, renderings that the architect had sent him. So the first big point here is that mystical experience is just one form of psychedelic experience. And there are, there are dozens and dozens of other ones. The second point is that you don't need psychedelics to have a mystical experience or to experience God or to find revelation. Um, in, in his book, God, A Story of Revelation, Deepak Chopra talks about four other pathways, uh, service, drowning yourself like Rumi did in, in the joy of God's existence, um, you, you know, of, of pathways, of meditation, of getting to um, mystical experience. But what's fascinating here is that what we're finding uh, over and over again is that the mystical experience is the key to healing. Now, why? And so if you take it out, you may end up with a foam psychedelic experience um, and I don't know what the interest in psychedelic companies would be in doing that. Um, I don't even want to go there right now uh, because one of the things would be that, okay, it's not psychedelic anymore. Then I don't have to, um, you know, well, I, I might not have FDA problems, but I don't think that's the real reason. I think what's the core here is what is it about the mystical experience as Roland Griffiths says, it helps us see things from the larger perspective. For dying people, it takes, takes them out of themselves and see that they're a part of a larger, larger river of life. And they come back saying, it's okay. This is what's happening. And as the daughter of one of these patients said, my father's strength gave, you know, the, the, the psilocybin gave him strength, the mystical experience gave him strength. And his strength gave us strength to deal with his passing. Uh, as Robin Carhart Harris shows in his, in his um, you know, magnetic imaging, magnetic resonance imaging, which measures blood flow to certain parts of the brain before and after magic mushrooms, before and after um, LSD, that multiple pathways, neural pathways open up in the brain. And there's only a few dozens that are activated. And you can visually see how we're only using a small part of our brain. And somehow, opening up those other pathways seem to be get involved in healing. In certain things, like mild cognitive impairment and, and pre precursor to Alzheimer's, it may even be that the psychedelic itself opens up new neural pathways. But this is all happens in a pretty mystical, transcendental realm. So why would you want to extract the, the, the success factor from psychedelic therapy? Um, this is the question that I would put back to the people saying, well, do we need this mystical experience? Right. You know, and uh, I'm not going to, you know, try to uh, speculate on all of the dimensions of that conversation. Yeah, and I think part of it too is just, I guess, around like framing mystical experiences and, and the context around it, which also brings up um, a point around the shadow side of things, right? And I wonder if kind of like the dogma and kind of, you know, you, you kind of mentioned some of the research um, from the Pew Institute and people kind of moving away from um, mainstream institutions, religious institutions, becoming more spiritual. 
like what type of dynamics could unfold when we wrap up psychedelics um, and religion, mystical experiences and thinking about the abuse that's happened, maybe cult dynamics over the years. Um, and I wonder if that also kind of plays a role in not trying to fit it into this box and kind of create dogma around an experience. Um, and I don't know, have you thought about kind of like the shadow sides of, of that aspect with psychedelics and religion? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've read about some of these horrific situations, you know, with ayahuasca uh, and with other drugs where, you know, therapists have been abusive, um, physically abusive, sexually abusive, emotionally abusive. Now, as of yet, there's no Yelp. You know, there's no Yelp for psychedelic therapists or, or shamans. Um, but the community has mobilized to call you know, these people out, give them an opportunity to defend themselves, their practices, but really make people aware. And I think this is, you know, this is definitely part of why, um, you know, this do no harm principle that's in medicine and psychedelics code of ethics is, is so important. I don't think it's preventable given the rapid proliferation that's taking place now you know, you have sort of the, the, the people who were involved in it early 40s, 50s, 60s, then the 60s and 70s generation, underground movement, um, psychedelic renaissance, right? But now, as with every trend, it happens, you have the early people, and then the people with money and the people who chase, you know, high, high fashion taste, the latest cultural fad, they come around it because it's hip and cool because it's still edgy. And then, you know, the carnival barkers come around it. Like, hey, I can turn a quick dollar here. I mean, if I can charge, you know, $12,000 for a four day retreat and get, you know, 20 people to show up, plus they're paying airfare and room and board, that's a real nice thing. And it doesn't matter that I'm not trained or I went to one ayahuasca session and now I say I'm a shaman or a guru or a you know, child of light. And there is also, obviously, with people, you know, being hyper suggestible, another thing that happens in psychedelic experience. I mean, you can look at a, a flicker on the wall and go into heaven or hell, right. you know, depending on, on what you're bringing to the session. Uh, there's a tremendous potential for cultish, uh, you know, cult leaders to sort of exploit that. And we've seen it. We know it's there. We have to continually be on the alert for it and um, fortunate, you know, and, and work so that it doesn't derail yeah. the, the great progress that's, that's going on. And I think it's like uh, just to, to borrow an American Civil Liberties Union phrase, you know, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And I think that eternal vigilance within the psychedelic community against all kinds of abuse uh, by, um, you know, egomaniacal leaders or phony holies, as Julie and I call them, people who, you know, are, are, want to put themselves out as a spiritual leader and they have no credentials uh, for that. Um, you know, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. And we have to be vigilant for that so it doesn't derail uh, the good things that, that are happening. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, it's something that we all have to kind of look out for in the community and kind of, um, yeah, just keep an eye out, educate yourself around that. And, um, you know, if you are doing any of this work, really kind of vetting the people that you're working with, right? Um, it's definitely a, a yeah, big Yeah, sort of like as Michael Pollan did. As Michael Pollan did, you know, when he interviewed guides for his illegal, you know, underground psychedelic adventures for his book, um, How to Change Your Mind. You have to vet people, talk to people. Yeah. All right, Jerry. So another question that we ask here is, what's the most vital teaching point that psychedelic practitioners need to become skilled and expert in? Could you repeat that, please? Yeah. What's the most vital teaching point that psychedelic practitioners need to become skilled and expert in? Well, and I've, I've talked with um, Julie, who's a psychotherapist, uh, about this and have several uh, ideas here. I think... The primary thing, and it's not just for psychedelic practitioners, but I think it's for all therapists, is 
the establishment of trust between the therapist and the client. What they call in shamanism, you know, the shamanic fluid, that, that kind of bond. If that trust is there, then the client will be comfortable in unpeeling the onion to get to the inner core of what their presenting issue is, why, they, why they're there, what they want um, to heal. Without that trust, it's very difficult for things to happen. In fact, uh, Adelaide Bry wrote a book called, um, I forget the title of the book, uh, but what she did in that particular book, it'll, it'll come to me, was she interviewed nine different mature therapists who were advanced in their field, well-established, you know, successful, primal scream, Freudian, Jungian, Skinnerian, etc., behavioral uh, modification. And she asked them, what are the keys to your success? And for none of them, it, it, in, no, in not one case was the answer, the modality in which I work with. Mm. The first thing was trust with a client. If a client doesn't trust me, if I don't feel at ease with them, it's better that they seek someone else because without that trust, that is first and foremost. And I think therapists have to be aware of that and understand uh, if that's happening in the, in the early sessions so that the client will really allow themselves to be vulnerable. The other uh, thing I'd like to talk about and that Julie uh, has used very successfully in her work is uh, guided imagery mm. or visualization. And this comes out of um, the work in psychosynthesis in which Julie was trained, but there are you know, many other um, uh, pathways into it. And basically what the therapist does in guided imagery is it helps the client evoke images, interact with those images, and process those images. So for example, uh, Julie had a client, he was young, he was 14 years old, he had cancer, and she tried, she worked a lot with cancer patients, and she tried to get him to visualize, and he didn't, he couldn't, he was very resistant. She says, what do you like? What do you really like? He says, I like space. All right, I want you to put yourself inside of a spaceship and go into your bloodstream and find the cancer. Mm. And he went inside and he did that. And he started blasting the cancer away. Now, I'm not gonna get into the whole thing of how, because there's a long discussion about how we have argued in our paper, Mystical Experience with Cancer Patients, that guided imagery, along with psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, could help heal even cancer, not just alleviate, the, the psychological uh, anxiety and depression. But guided imagery is an extremely powerful tool. Julie worked with it over 30 years with 50 patients and 80% of them recovered. Um, according to their oncologist, it means their cancers were in remission five years down the road. After and they were getting traditional the, cancer treatment, yeah. I'm guessing, too. So this is an extremely, extremely powerful tool. You know, um, someone has, a, 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 you know, difficulty expressing themselves. They can't, you know, they're, in a, they're powerless in a, in a relationship where someone's taken all the power. And they can't seem to find a voice to, to establish some equal ground. So Julie has, you know, put, you know, and... Put your hand over your throat. Allow an image to emerge. What does the image want to say? And it may be that their father always beat them down, you know, with some, one of these drill sergeant fathers who, you know, just always got power tripped and they just developed somatic blockages mm -hmm. to expressing themselves. So I think this is an extremely powerful tool for therapists, both with and without psychedelics, Julie, who of course could not use, although she's a ex well-experienced 
psychonaut going all the way back to the 60s, um, could not use psychedelics in her therapy practice. They were illegal. And, um, but she is absolutely convinced that had she been able to combine psychedelics with guided imagery, she would have had greater success um, and faster results. That's how powerful um, the psychedelics um, in combination with guided imagery are. Uh, there's a couple of books. The classic in this field is uh, Shakti Gwain, Creative Visualization. Uh, they just came out in 2016 with the 40th uh, anniversary uh, edition of Shakti mm. Gwain's uh, Creative Visualization. So I well, think for that. trust with the therapist and understanding and integrating visualization as a tool are two things that could be tremendously useful for practitioners. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you had any resources for visualization or if uh, yeah. Julie got any sort of specific training on that. Um, I can get a little more specific. Um, there's a book by Dr. Michael Samuels called Healing with the Mind's Eye. Dr. Michael Samuels, Healing with the Mind's Eye, 2003. And Dr. Gerald Epstein, Healing Visualizations, Creating Health Through Imagery, uh, 1989. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, and the topic of um, visualization is just really interesting because when we think about psychedelics and some of the visualizations that do come up, right? It's like people are engaging in some sort of narrative while they're in the experience. And then, um, you know, what's going on there? Is that playing a role in the person's healing, right? There's definitely the physiology possibly with um, how, it, how it's uh, interacting with our body. Um, but also, what is the narrative that's unfolding within? And I guess I come more kind of from that, that, that depth Jungian archetypal um, type of background where that is very important to start to engage in that inner narrative, create new like visualization um, patterns and be able to maybe change that narrative. I, I think a, a lot about um, some of my most powerful breathwork sessions were really based around having a visualization going into that narrative and being able to change it a little bit and be like, oh, wait, like that narrative's part of me, but it doesn't need to necessarily be me. How can I start to rearrange that, shape it a little bit differently and, and maybe rewrite it? And I do kind of like those narrative approaches to, to therapy. I think they can be really helpful. And how do you incorporate visualization into that as well? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it works, Kyle, as you know, on all kinds of level. Some of it is mythical and archetypal. Uh, for example, one report of a... Um, mystical psychedelic experience on high dose LSD was this woman who was um, riven throughout with phobias, had a lot of fears, fear to live life, fear of death, fear of people, etc. Uh, she's deep into her psychedelic session and she comes to this sort of mythic level. She finds herself riding on the back of a large muscular Bengal tiger the tiger takes her up a mountain through a forest and they come to the edge of a volcano in which the lava is like boiling, you know, down below. The tiger leaps into the lava and she reemerges as a phoenix mm -hmm. and flies away as, a, as a, the bird of phoenix. I mean, this is pure Jungian archetype in which... Uh, with the phoenix is one of the five major archetypes, birth, death, and rebirth, that uh, Jung talked about. And it can be also, you know, something much more pedestrian. Um, I, I once worked with visualization uh, with a person who just, they were doing what they loved, but they were incredibly unhappy and they couldn't put their finger on it. So we went into a, a visualization and deep into the visualization, they saw themselves as lying on an altar and several people in their organization were bird-like creatures with long beaks, those long thin beaks that were sucking the life out of them. And they realized that they were working around people who were really bringing them mm. down yeah. and they decided to move on. 
At, but the, the breakthrough insight, look, our brain spoke to us. We communicated our brain in images before we developed language. Yeah. And the language pushes that out of the way, but that can be a very powerful form of insight and truth, both with psychedelics or just with psychotherapy to use visualization to bring the truth, a visual image of the truth of a situation uh, to the forefront of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, really important. Um, something you brought up just around establishing trust and rapport with um, clients. Um, actually, uh, my teacher Lenny just brought this up a few days ago on a call. Um, I believe this this study came from Bergen and Gartfield. Um, it might be in the handbook of psychotherapy and behavior change. Um, I think that's where he, he, he caught this. But just highlighting the importance of relationship and healing. And supposedly this study was done, um, I think it was with college students. And there's two groups. One went to a therapist. Another went to um, just a, a professional. Professor. And the outcome was pretty much the same um, on, on kind of like their healing. The only difference is that the clinical folks use more clinical jargon when they were talking about their, their experiences. Um, and I find like the, the participant, uh, research participants, um, that kind of talk about their, their, um, yeah, their healing experience, they would use more clinical um, jargon. So I find that to be important when we're thinking about um, developing uh, relationships, right? Like having clinical skills skills is important. Um, but, you know, also, what are some of those skills to really um, build trust, build rapport, build, um, you know, this, this relationship with people? Um, you because know, I, I think the as core a, of it, right, we're all human. <laughs> yeah, I think as a, a person who, you know, has a lot more guiding experience than I do, I would turn that question over to Julie, where she here today. But what is your thought about that, Kyle? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I usually try to take that approach of meeting the person where they're at. Um, I think having a, a nice background in trauma-informed approaches and, and somatics has been really beneficial um, over the years, just learning a, a, like attunement and understanding how somebody is attuning to you, um, noticing when maybe their, their nervous system is getting a little too overactivated um, or they, they kind of get into a freeze mode. Um, and really really just trying to support the person, right? Like, uh, yeah, what are you looking for relationships? Are you always looking for somebody to tell you what you need to be doing and um, how to be? Or do you, um, you know, are you just really looking for, for some support? Um, one of my teachers uh, gave me a piece of advice, and I think about it pretty often when um, I, I, I asked him, you know, what are some of the skills people really need to know to really build trust and, and to be with people when they're sitting with them in, in non-ordinary states? And he just asked, he's like, well, who did you need when you were dying on the mountain when you had your snowboarding accident? And I thought about it, and I just needed somebody there to, to, to remind me I'm going to be okay. I didn't need somebody to ask me a million questions. I just needed a, just a loving, grounded support. And that was very nonverbal too, just somebody there, their presence. Um, so I think it is around cultivating your own inner presence um, and learning how to regulate your own nervous system. So when we do get triggered, um, when there are things going on, how can we also let that out of our bodies um, so we're not also letting that impact um, you know, the, the therapeutic relationship? Which is, you know, skills in itself, right? Um, sure. And, and sometimes those are hard to teach. Maybe it's a lot of like intuition and um, grounding skills and also your own self-awareness, um, you know? And I think we're all learning, right? Like I'm no expert. I'm, we're all human. We have flaws and um, we don't always show up perfectly in all relationships. But um, I think just trying to cultivate that self-awareness um, is probably yeah. key. Or, or as they say about divorce, that's why they put erasers on pencils. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's yeah. all tremendous learning experiences. Obviously, like over half America gets divorced and then, you know, over 90 percent of them want to get married again. So we we're we are at essence relational creatures we and, um, you know, uh, who crave intimacy, a significant other, someone to share the journey with someone to, to talk to and um, and. What I find as an educator ironic is we have all these courses to develop life skills, 
But in terms of happiness and fulfillment, <laughs> you know, they don't give us much of a manual on that. Yeah. And um, I think that we are getting much more aware that many of us have had trauma from our families, uh, baggage, um, are still working out things with our parents, even if they're long deceased, uh, that are unresolved uh, conflicts. And um, this, is, this is the value, I think, of, of psychedelics. And they seem to be moving towards success with a higher efficiency. And we haven't even, Kyle, touched on microdosing, which is non-perceptual, sub-psychedelic, small doses of psilocybin or LSD, 10 to 15 micrograms, a millionth of a gram, you know, every three days, one day on, two days off. And that seems to have the potential for elevating mood, helping people focus. That's why, you know, there's, it's a trend in Silicon Valley. There's been a Rolling Stone article, microdosing the drug your employer <laughs> would want you to take. And that might be the game changer because it's inexpensive. You don't need a clinical ses setting to do that. You know, you might need some, some phone or, or internet support. Um, it doesn't seem to have any side effects and it's relatively inexpensive. So this might be a game changer. As I say, we've just put our toe in the water of where, um, where the particular uh, research can go. I'm always reminded where it feels like we're, even though, um, you know, a lot of research has happened in the past um, and this is really getting reignited, we're just at the beginning, right? Absolutely. Um, we're, there's so much to explore, so much potential still um, still there and we're still at the beginning. And so how do we uh, continue to be open and curious um, around uh, a lot of these questions? Um, it's really important. Yeah. And as we wrap up, can we mention the course one time, the Psychedelics Past, Present and Future? Yeah. Yeah. You want to do another pitch for that? Yeah. I just want to say um, I'm very delighted that Psychedelics Today has invited me to, to design a course on uh, Psychedelics Past, Present and Future. It's a six session recorded course with supporting notes and videos and directories. And you can take it at your own pace anytime, anywhere. And I, the instructors for the course are yours truly and my wife, Julie Brown, a psychonaut and a psychotherapist. And Kyle, do you want to tell people where they can find it? Yeah. So if you're interested in learning more and signing up, you can check that out at psychedeliceducationcenter.com. You'll see a whole list of our classes up there. So you can just scroll down. Um, I don't, sometimes I don't know how Teachable organizes that stuff. So it will be on there. Um, and also wanted to mention that if you are a professional, um, it's also CE approved. Um, so you'll uh, be able to get uh, six CE credits um, with the sign up. Um, well, there's two sign up options there's a general admission and then the CE option as well. So, um, yeah, excited about that. And Jerry, I'm also super excited for you to be kicking off Vital um, on April 19th, um, where we'll kick that off and explore why this, why the pass is important. Um, and it's also being kicked off on Bicycle Day. So I, I really appreciate the historical event that we decided to launch this course on. <laughs> Anything Great that you want to mention around Vital? Um, no, I mean, I, I just having been immersed in the past as an anthropologist, um, and I think one of the great errors of the 1960 was to treat this all as new discoveries instead of drawing into drawing on uh, and drinking from that deep well of historical roots of psychedelics that might have made it a little more palatable uh, to our culture. Although I don't think anything would have gotten past Nixon's determination to um, criminalize psychedelics to help him undermine the um, civil rights and the anti-war movement. But that's a story for another day. So um, I'm very happy to explore uh, psychedelics in Christianity and other religions and in shamanism and why the past is important, both uh, from ethno-botanical point of view, the production of medicines that, and these were the original healers, the shamans and were the original uh, healers to humanity on a spiritual level and on a physical level and in the shamanic world those two were uh, intimately intertwined yeah 
Well, Dr. Jerry Brown, this has been awesome as always. Always enjoy recording with you. Do you want to direct people towards your website? Where can people find out more about your work? Sure. I mean, you can find out all about our book on uh, psychedelicgospels.com, psychedelicgospels.com. We also post a lot of our research, other findings and new things that are news that's happening in the psychedelic community from uh, business to um, new therapy programs on our Facebook page, Psychedelic Gospels. So if you Google uh, search Psychedelic Gospels on Facebook, you'll find a lot of our posts and can scroll back uh, through them. Also on our Facebook, on our website, psychedeliggospels.com, there's a bunch of videos of presentations that Julie and I have made, including Julie's mystical experience, including my presentation on psychedelics and Christian art uh, made to breaking convention in 2019. A lot of good resources there. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, well, thank you again, and thank you, everybody, for tuning into this episode, and we'll catch you on the next one. So take care, and we'll catch you next time. Bye.